while I've been backstage, my presentation has sort of worked its way forward a little bit. Hi. I'm all that stands between you and free drinks. <laughs> I want you to know that I'm acutely aware of that. Now, um, over the last 50 years, the architecture world has been painfully aware of the fact that their discipline has done a poor job of designing our built environment, and by that I mean our buildings and our public spaces, our hospitals and our airports and our train stations and those things for people. That may come as a surprise to you. Architects are designers. Architects will tell you that they are human-centered designers for who else occupies these buildings that they design and construct. And I'm going to talk a little bit about where they're struggling, why they're struggling, and how interaction designers are in the process of helping them. I'm going to try not to be overly critical of architects. They do wonderful stuff. But it's something that they themselves recognize as being an area that they could do better. Now, I had the privilege of seeing this gentleman talk uh, just a few weeks ago in Montreal at the World Design Summit. And he has spent the last, that's not better. I'm not sure what just happened there. Um, he has spent the last 40 to 50 years of his career trying to get cities to design for people. Now, he says himself that he's doing a good job, um, that he's having an impact, and yet he can name the cities where he's had an impact, and there are a lot more cities in the world. There's a lot of work to be done. I'm going to talk a little bit about interaction design first, just so you understand what I think of as interaction design. Some of that, I hope, won't come as a surprise to this audience, given that you all practice some form of interaction design. That's why we're here. However, um, there are some things to it, and more importantly, I want to talk to you about where my practice of interaction design and our practice at Meld Studios has intersected with the built environment and what we've been doing about it. Now, interaction design at its lowest level, at these little bits that we design, the little controls, the UI pieces, sit at what I think of as the plane of interaction, the screen, the thing you touch, the mouse that you move, the things that you click. And there are a lot of these sort of small things that represent what's effectively a request response type mechanism. I press something, something happens. I slide something, something happens. I enter some data, something happens. It's a very um, binary operation, if you like, pardon the pun, but it's a, it's a very discrete thing that we're designing. Now, uh, folk by the name of Dan Saffer, if we've heard of Dan Saffer, yeah, not enough hands are up, people. Dan Saffer had some wise words to say about micro-interactions. Dan's going to hate the fact that only a few of you put your hands up, and he will watch this video. So he's going to be disappointed. The difference between a product you love and a product you tolerate quite often comes down to these small interactions that are built into the interface. They might only be a very, very discrete thing. An example of that is something like Facebook's like button. To begin with, it was just a very discrete interaction. They've made it more complicated by allowing you to express a small number of emotions. Um, and as we heard earlier today, uh, when Cynthia was talking, we have many more emotions than the six I'm allowed to express through Facebook. And perhaps one day they'll expand that list and it'll maybe be you know, sort of six or seven rows of things that I can try and click on. And it will no longer be a micro interaction. It will now be a force of nature. However, this is a micro-interaction. It's a small thing, but it has a great impact on the way in which we interact with the product. 
but it's this very, very discreet thing that we are interacting with. There's more behind that, though. I'm not just clicking buttons for the sake of it. I'm not sliding dials for the sake of it. What I'm trying to do is probably perform some sense of an activity. I'm trying to achieve or complete some task. There's a sequence that we need to understand. There's a structure of information and a structure of tasks. We need to think about how those things build towards completing something useful. It's not enough that there's just some random widgets on a screen, although I've seen some interfaces that feel like it. We also need to think about how one screen, one set of buttons are consistent. This should all be familiar territory. We don't design a single page with random designs for various different buttons. We try and create a visual language and an interaction library, and we try and maintain a certain sense of consistency that goes right across our application, or across our app, or across our, our, our web form, or page, or whatever it might be. There is a purpose to those things, but they're still quite discreet. Hashtags are an example. So this is something where part of that interaction is trying to express something deeper, and it builds into something more than just my hashtag. When I use a hashtag, like the one at the conference, it gets aggregated with all of the tweets that you've used where you've used that hashtag, and that allows things to be done like trends, and those trends can be localized and, and um, a specific geography or a specific language group or whatever it might be, and now we can pay to have something trending, which is an ad, people. That's an ad. Paying for a trending tweet is an ad. Anyway. That's a whole other thing. Twitter and politics, Facebook and politics, that's a whole other talk. Let's not go there. This is back in 2000 and, I wanna say 2007, only because it's 10 years ago, but it might be 2008. Um, John Colco, and I'll ask the question again, who's heard of John? More hands than Dan, and Dan's gonna hate that even more. <laughs> wow. Um, John's in Austin, um, and he wrote this uh, some time ago, but he talks about interaction design being a dialogue between an individual, so it's a designed conversation, if you like, between an individual and a product or a service or a system. This really resonates with me when we start to talk about the design of a public space or the design of a building because what we're trying to create and the way in which we articulate this work quite often is in the form of a narrative. A journey map, for example, and again, I'm gonna ask you to put your hand up. Journey maps is a tool that people use, great. A journey map is and should be a narrative. You are telling a story about a customer's journey. It is exactly this, it is the dialogue. It is the conversation that you intend to design and bring to life. So what we're, what we're talking about is how these things build, how one thing leads into the next, how we have a logical sequence that allows us to achieve some kind of task, and that task should be something of significance to the customer or the user. Now, Those things, though, quite often in themselves, you know, like that task or that activity, in itself doesn't uh, exist in a vacuum. An example is ordering a book. So if I go online, I go somewhere like Amazon or to even to your local bookstore that's online, and I order a book, ordering the book is not the point. I want to read. I want to give a gift. Until the book arrives, the activity or the task is only half complete. So now we need to start thinking about how book purchasing leads into delivery and logistics, how it feeds into reordering the next book so that it can be ready for the next person who orders. That opens up a whole other area of how we understand and how we design systems. This is where service design starts to differentiate itself from interaction design because now we're designing the end-to-end -end and the back-end of a service rather than the customer-facing interactions. But here's the interesting part where we started to get caught up in, in our practice. 
which is you have to start thinking about architecture. You have to start thinking about physical environments. It's hard to ignore them once you zoom out to this level of thinking about interaction design. Your interactions on the screen almost always lead to a physical component to them. There aren't many examples where that's not the case. Now, so over the last eight years, our practice has gone through um, and followed this journey outwards from screens to systems. And we found ourselves increasingly working with architects and increasingly working with engineers. Um, and it so happens that I've spent most of this year working on train stations. Now, who, who likes the idea of designing a train station? You all should have your hands up. It's fantastic. It's so much fun. It is, it is a big boy's version of a train set. And who doesn't love a train set? It's wonderful. And look, I'll, I'll, I'll talk to some examples, but what you've got is an environment where people have a variety of different tasks, but the people who have that task are enormously complex. Um, one last example. The iPod as a closed system is a useful one to think about. On its own, the device, pretty useless. It's pretty useless on its own. Until you put music on it. Great once it's got music on it. Where does the music come from? The iTunes service. Being able to buy songs online through the iTunes uh, store, organize them through the iTunes library, that's when the iPod took off. Up to that point, it was just another um, MP3 player. After it was connected into this system, that's when it became... It took three years to become an overnight success. It's crazy. But it needed these other components. I want to talk about three things when it comes to working with architects and engineers in particular, and I'm going to pick on those two groups in particular because they are the most responsible for what gets built. Now, I'm going to save for another day criticism of councils, city planners, um, governments of various sorts, large corporations who commission these things and have some degree and sometimes quite a big degree of control over what gets built, but the people putting pen to paper are the architects and the engineers. So I want to talk about three things. One is what interaction design looks like once you get into physical environments. We'll talk about some of the things that we need to take into account and we'll look at some examples from uh, some railways that we've been or some train stations that we've been looking at. I also want to touch on this business of designing for construction. Greg made the, um, made the comment in his last talk um, just a few minutes ago about agile methods and agile methods of um, you know, designing and developing rapid iterations, get something out in the world, test it, refine it, put something else out into the world. I know there's a few people, um, probably more than a few in the audience, who work in an agile way where your prototype is, is a live beta where you're constantly evolving. Does not work when you're building things with concrete and steel and bricks and cables. You are much more constrained. You are much more constrained. I think it was Frank Lloyd Wright who, who said you can, um, you know, like an eraser on the drafting board is um, an architect's best friend. His next best friend is a crowbar on the site. And it's much easier to erase a line or change something on the drawing board when it's just an idea than it is to start changing construction. And clients don't like doing it. Once they get into, especially large infrastructure jobs, large buildings jobs, they just don't want to make changes. They've committed to a timeline. They've committed to a budget. They've got a big hole in the ground that's going to be filled with concrete. It's going to build up with steel and iron and, and other bits and pieces. 
they don't want to change. Once they've committed to that part of it, they really don't want to change. And their process is very much geared to it. I'm going to talk about designing for construction. Um, I also want to talk about just some of the tools, techniques, and attitude that this audience can bring to this type of project to make them more successful and more successful in the way that Jan was talking about, which is that the people who are using them are actually happy with them. So interaction design in the physical environment. Um, just like on screens, just like on your device or when designing for the web, there are a number of different scales at which interaction design and design takes place within a physical environment. We can't ignore any of those. We need to make sure that each of those ones is being taken into account. In an architectural uh, job and in an engineering job, the thing that we tend to do first is deal with issues that will have the most impact on cost. So things that will have major structural change are the things we deal with first, and then we work our way down. Interestingly, in buildings, that means stairs, elevators, escalators are three of the most important things that get designed early on, because they have the biggest impact on the footprint of the building. And we go from there. Just like in a digital system, the detail can absolutely make or break the design. We've seen time and again uh, how small details can actually completely change people's ability to use it. We saw a story, uh, we saw an example, I'll, I'll give you a quick example. We saw um, one of the train stations we were looking at, at redesigning um, had a long pathway leading out onto the road and it came down a hill and then led to a pedestrian crossing where you know, like there's a set of lights and, and out people go. And they go across a busy intersection and they get to the far side of it and up they go and they disappear into something on the far side. Looks great. When you stand there and you look down the hill and out and through, perfect. Turn it around though, coming across that street in a wheelchair, there was no way to get up onto the pedestrian, like onto the footpath. Not there. You had to come halfway up that side street, halfway up that alley, before you could get off the road. So someone in a wheelchair was having to travel along the road in order to get out of the traffic and to safety up a hill. And it had been designed that way. But it had never been designed with a person in a wheelchair in mind. It had never been tested with them. No one ever asked them their opinion. And so they ended up with a design that was absolutely suboptimal. Downright dangerous. And again, Cynthia's point earlier, what's the worst that can happen? Well, a car hits the wheelchair. That's the worst that can happen. A car hits a wheelchair. Did it need to happen? Absolutely not. And that sort of brings me to that last point, which is that people are diverse and so are their needs. We need to test with all of them. I'm going to keep coming back to this notion of testing in addition to just sort of basic research, but I'm going to keep coming back to this notion of testing and the different things that we need to test with. Okay, touch points. You go to a railway station, you go to a, um, uh, an airport, you've got to get through security or get through some gates. These are the wonderful gates that we use in my hometown of Sydney. You use a, a, an electronic card called an Opal card, and these are the gates. Now, in my work as, a, as an interaction designer and as a service designer, I get told that this is what they look like. That's it. This is a standard piece of equipment. The width is standard. They're exactly 84 centimetres apart, except for the wide gate, which is double that. Wide gates are for people with prams, wheelchairs, luggage, small children, moving a bicycle, a whole bunch of other things. But this is a standard thing. What we do in these situations is not try and redesign the gate. What we're looking to do is design the behaviour. Now, as interaction designers, we design for behaviour all the time. 
I think it was Rob Fabricant, uh, a few years ago in 2009, I think, he stood up at the Vancouver Interaction Conference and said, behaviour is our medium as interaction designers. Behaviour is the thing that we're actually designing more than anything else. So what behaviour do we want at these gates? You think about when you approach a turnstile or a gate, what you want to do is just keep going, walk straight through without stopping. More to the point, I want the person in front of me to walk through without stopping. Because if they stop, then I've got to stop, and then I can go through. So what we're looking to do is design an environment that includes these gates that people approach with confidence and pass through with confidence. So what we started to look at was, well, what's the lighting doing? Is it a well-lit space? Do I have visibility about what's beyond it? Because going through that gate costs me money. The minute I go through that gate, to get out again is going to cost me money. So I want to have confidence that I'm going through the right gate, that I can get to the right train or catch the right bus or that's the right. So what we're talking about is actually designing a wayfinding system, signage, both directional and labelling, a lighting system that actually highlights the gate rather than something else beyond it. So we're working with interior architects, we're working with the industrial designers, we're working with a, a wayfinding specialist. And a wayfinding specialist is essentially an information architect for the physical world. So we're working with those people to design the behaviour that we want to see. And we're doing it in a way that appreciates what this is like at different times of day. So here's the thing. If that gate, if I approach that gate as it stands right now, I can take all the time in the world. There's nobody there. There's nobody around. Station's quiet, it doesn't matter. This was taken in the middle of the afternoon, like two o'clock. Nobody's using the train station at two o'clock. So it doesn't matter. I can walk up, I can look for the signs, I can check my phone to see what platform I need to go to. I can, there's four other gates that people can use. I don't care as a designer that that behavior is taking place in that moment. During the morning peak though, at this train station, something like 25,000 people per hour move through those gates. 25,000 people per hour, just bang, bang, bang. And they're queued up in a long line that stretches all the way out the door. They just sort of all come in together and through the gates and beyond and disperse out into the things. And it's just a continuous stream of people moving in. You want to make sure that that's happening. The last thing you want is for any of those people to walk up to that gate and stop. They will be trampled. They will be trampled. It's like you people in half an hour going for your first drink at the end of the day. If someone stopped in the doorway, you'd hit them. Get out of my way. And it's exactly the same in these sorts of circumstances. So again, what we're designing in this case is not the interaction itself, but we're trying to ensure that the behavior that we're looking for is one that we appreciate. Now, the thing about architects and the thing about engineers is that they don't quite understand individuals. They don't really understand what drives an individual's behavior. So they don't really understand that in that moment, I might be hesitant. I might be nervous. I might have questions. And so they don't think to design for it. And the end result is one in which people are hesitant and they do get in the way and people do get hurt. We're back to that again, tragedy. So we think about this notion of flow. Now, in something like a, a, a transit environment, we want people who can move through a space, find their way with confidence, not stop where we don't want them to stop. And we actually have to design, sorry, that's the air conditioning. We actually want to design so that people have clear spaces where they can stop, where they can pause. There's a, 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 another um, entrance to this train station, which is, uh, 
It's probably about 250 metres of straight tunnel. It's about six metres wide. And again, during peak hour, thousands of people flow along it. And every now and again, they've got these uh, information boards that tell you when the trains are coming. And I think there's two of them at different spots along this tunnel. But when the tunnel's busy, there is nowhere for you to stop to read that board. Again, quite literally, if you stopped, you would get trampled. It's just like thousands of people flying through this tunnel. The information board is therefore pointless. It's doing exactly what you don't want it to do. It's encouraging people to stop and become a roadblock for other people. You become the obstacle that you don't want to be in this world. It's bad positioning. But see what else is going on here? It's raining. We took footage at two different times, on a dry day, and then we, we specifically went out and took this footage when it was raining. Because people behave differently when they get under cover in the rain. You would have seen it if anyone went outside while it was raining earlier, you didn't sort of walk out under the tent and keep walking outside. You get wet. So you pause. So people are coming out of the station, pausing, putting up their umbrella, and then continuing. So now you've got this sort of temporary dwell space, whereas on a sunny day, it's a flow space. People just flow straight out of it. They're doing the other thing in reverse. They run across the street, they stop in this spot, they put their umbrella down, shake it off, but they spend a few moments in that space. So the characteristics of, of the movement of people through here and their behaviour is totally different. It's the same at night. Nighttime has different attributes to it than daytime. So when we're doing our research, we need to factor that in. We need to make sure that we're thinking about, in a way that we don't really need to in digital environments, we suddenly need to think about, well, what if it's a hot day? What if it's a cold day? What if it's raining? In Australia, and, and particularly in Sydney, I don't have to ask questions like, is it snowing? So my friends in Montreal, um, they need to worry about things like, is it snowing? In Sydney, it's never snowed. In 160 years of weather records, it has never snowed in Sydney. It's why I live there, instead of places like Montreal, where it snows. I don't like snow. I think it's fair. I do not like it. Um, I don't think it would snow here either, would it? No. You would like Sydney. For that and other reasons. Oh, let's go back one. The last thing that I want to sort of say as we, as we sort of step out from an individual interaction and, and, and broaden out is that the actual... Hang on. No. The actual um, environment that we're dealing with doesn't exist in isolation. One of the big criticisms of modernist architecture is that they design these objects effectively that have this sort of space around them that doesn't clutter the design and allows you to fully appreciate the shape of the building. Well, that sort of leads to this sort of notion of creating something that's isolated, quite literally isolated. What we really want to understand in these environments when we're designing like this is how does this piece feed into the next piece? So just like when I buy a book online, I'm not doing it just so I can buy a book. I'm not giving money to Amazon for the sake of it. I don't catch a train because I want to catch a train typically. I catch a train because I want to get from one spot to another spot. And getting from one spot to another spot is probably not just a train ride. Maybe I caught a bike, maybe I took the bus, maybe I took a taxi or an Uber or a Lyft or something like that, maybe I walked, maybe somebody dropped me off. But it probably wasn't an isolated thing that I did. So, we need to think of how these things connect and we need to think of these things not in isolation. There's also a real opportunity in design of these sorts of spaces to think about this part of the experience. 
want you to imagine that you're a local resident or someone who works in this, in, in this neighbourhood. This part of Sydney has looked like this for just on three years. And we're about to begin a new project that will make it just like this for another four. It's a mess. It's dangerous. So these, um, these hoardings, these fences, limit your visibility. You step out onto a street and the hoarding is right up alongside the pavement in some places. So where you go through that pedestrian crossing, there are the cars. That's dangerous. You sort of come out just a little bit, someone with a pram who just pushes it a little bit too far, someone in a wheelchair who just rolls a little bit too forward, someone with a child who takes one extra step before they're pulled back. None of those things are good. This wasn't really thought through. And there's fundamentally an opportunity to actually think about that. We want the end design, so we want the service that we deliver, the building or the rail system or whatever it might be, to have some you know, experiential characteristics that make it world-class and excellent and delightful and a variety of other things. And then we subject people to seven years of this crap while we build it. They're not gonna be thrilled with the notion of your new service or your new building if this is what you make them put up with in the interim. Is anyone here, I, I'm gonna, who remembers under construction websites. Thank goodness. I'm so glad you do. I was worried I was going to ask that question and people would be like, oh. I'm glad. Um, and, and yet I'm not glad because that was, that was this. I'm going to put something ugly and meaningless up while I make you wait for something that's actually good. And the longer you put up with that crap, the more you hope that it's really good or really, really good or fantastic or the best rail experience you've ever had, period. We can do much better than this. We can make it safer, we can make it more convenient, we can do our construction methods to minimise noise, minimise vibration, minimise the dust that gets thrown up. We can change these environments so that people actually feel safer in them rather than less safe and less secure. We can give people visibility rather than take it away from them. And it really isn't that hard. The missing ingredient, though, is actually caring about people and understanding that when an ordinary person is faced with this kind of environment, they're not happy about it and they don't feel comfortable. I learned an interesting thing while we were doing this work. Are you familiar with the notion of a guide dog? Is that, yeah? Okay. In order to learn a path somewhere, a guide dog is trained. It's not trained by the blind person who needs it or the, sight, the vision impaired person that, who needs it. It's trained by a coach, like a professional trainer. When the path changes, the trainer needs to come back out and retrain the dog. So when we do this type of thing, any person in that vicinity, any blind person who uses that environment now has to wait for a trainer to come out, retrain their dog so that the dog can now navigate this changed environment. I've seen construction um, programs where the intention is that these things move every two to four weeks. Now, essentially, if you rely on a guide dog, and even if you rely on a, a cane, that can mean the difference between you being able to use that train station at all or having to simply avoid it. And we've heard stories of people who would simply take a taxi instead, which costs money, which they may not have. And they certainly shouldn't have to. A few things that interaction designers bring to the party, if you like, and I'm, I'm talking about projects where we are working hand in glove with the architects and the engineers. We're sitting beside them, we're talking to them all the time, we're trying to get them to understand what we need from them. Um, that first point is a point of contention for a lot of architects. I want you to just read that to yourself. For most people in this audience, that would be a no-brainer. Customers have valuable insights to offer the design. And you put a full stop after that and you go, yeah, so. This has been a point of contention all year 
for me, working with these groups. They're not convinced that the people who will use these buildings have anything useful to offer to the design of that building. So that's been part of our journey this year, is to try and encourage a different mindset and actually demonstrate the value, and we've had to demonstrate it, they don't just take our word for it, but we've needed to find ways to demonstrate the value of engaging with customers. I've already mentioned this one about, we tend to focus on people. We tend to focus on individuals and how they feel and think and act and behave and what they need, what they love and what they hate, and we build that into our design to try and encourage them to have a better experience and more successfully do something. You do that all the time. Architects, engineers tend to focus on a macro scale. If you've ever seen an architect's model of things, it's a godlike view of the building, and they love it. They love being able to look down on this nicely shaped building. People just mess it up. We kind of ruin it. They quite often leave them out of the picture as a result. It's like, I'll keep the, because they, you know, people obscure the view. We don't. As interaction designers, you and I focus on individuals and focus on people as a core part of what we do. And again, the last one, research to inform and evaluate. No brainer, right? Um, this year, without fail, when working with architects and engineers on these projects, and, and these projects are not special in this regard, I've had people tell me this is the first time my design has been tested ever in my career. I've never had feedback from somebody about the utility or the usefulness of my design until it's been built, ever. And these are people who have been practicing architects for 20 years, 30 years. They've never put a design in front of another person and said, will this work for you? They'd only ever designed from their own perspective. And they would argue quite strongly that they were being human-centered because they were thinking about people. I mean, they put doors in and everything because there are people. I can't stress this one enough. Start with observation. Get out, go, look, watch. Take them with you. Take the engineers. Take the architects. Um, just putting someone in an environment like this where they can see people come and go and see the sorts of things that they do has been enormously valuable in our work so far this year. The number of things that they see that they just weren't thinking about by watching and, and seeing these people as they go about their business has been phenomenal. People walking with luggage, this person with the Zimmer frame helping them move along, and seeing how slowly that person walks. You can't really tell there because it's fast frame, but people who need help walking tend to walk much more slowly, much more slowly. So trying to understand that difference and trying to design for that behaviour is absolutely the first step. Talk to them in those moments, chat to them. That's the second step. Hear their story. Ask them what they're doing. Ask them how they're doing it. Ask them how they're feeling about it. Go and talk to them. That tends to generate a lot of data. This is one quarter of the data we generated from three weeks of, obs three weeks of observational research in a chain of cafes a few years ago. We would go into the cafe at seven in the morning when they opened and we would stay there until seven o'clock, eight o'clock, nine o'clock at night when they closed and we just watched everything that we could. That's the kind of data that you generate. Now again, on a, on a design project for you know, some of these railways, that's three weeks too long. They weren't looking for help from the customer in the first place they're sure as hell not going to wait three weeks for an answer. But this is the data and this is the process and you will know that this takes time to go through. 
this takes time to actually make sense of. But the insights that come out of this type of analysis, a qualitative analysis, is priceless. We share these stories with photos. We get people to, so we'll bring together that group of engineers and, and architects. Um, we've got construction engineers, people who are going to dig tunnels and lay cable and stuff. And we would get them and we would walk them through and tell them stories about what we'd seen and heard. We'd show them videos. Where we could, we would take them out. But we tried to really get through to them what we were, what, what we were seeing meant for them and, more importantly, for the design. And this was a key thing. We did work to test and then refine the design. This is obviously a VR kit, but the other things that we did uh, when we were testing these designs was we spoke to people, we showed them sketches, we showed them physical 3D models of things. So we let them play God, basically. We did this type of testing, and then we did walkthroughs uh, where we had a, a, an existing site that was being changed for some reason, we would take them out and get them to walk through the physical environment, the real space that was about to be changed, so that we could talk them through and get their feedback about that sketch you saw, that's this. This thing is going to be an escalator now. Oh, okay. What about, what about... And it's incredible with that kind of testing that's going on, the richness of the information that you're able to, to bring to bear and improve the design. One of the other things that we tried to do as much as we could was we had engineers and architects role play. So we would take them out and do these walkthroughs of stations, but we'd give them a pram to push. Most of the architects and the engineers that we work with are men. Most of them were middle-aged. Most of them were English-speaking. You know, they're all educated, obviously. Most of them had never pushed a pram. So that was a new experience for them, which they found a little bit fun just like pushing a pram through a railway station. This is weird. Um, pulling luggage behind them was, you know, like just made them think a little differently. We put um, eye patches over their eyes so that they couldn't see. Um, we got in a wheelchair and had them do that. We gave them a bike to wheel around to try and navigate with, you know, this in, these encumbrances. We gave people crutches just as a way, not of testing the design, but of building their empathy for the people who, who needed those things. It was just a way to help sort of break through that, what am I going to get from this and what are you going to offer? It allowed us to really sort of get through to a few of them. That helped quite a lot. You've got to actually use it though. And so we would do these playback sessions with them. One last story. And then I promise we can all go and have a drink. Make it a quick story. <laughs> a few years ago, um, Houston Airport, the executives at Houston Airport, and Houston Airport is in America, it's a big, busy airport, it's one of the hub airports for a major uh, airline, looked at their customer satisfaction, they were going to be customer centred, um, you know, it was their, their big push, and their executives sort of looked at well, what is annoying our customers? And the number one issue that was annoying their customers is how long they had to wait for their bags to come out of the baggage carousel. Now, who finds that annoying? Right. They decided that as part of being customer-centered, they would fix that problem. And so they set about understanding how their systems work, how the bags came off the plane. They benchmarked against the best airlines in the world. They benchmarked against the best airports in the world because the airport and the, and the airline work together. They're not the same. And they looked at the best systems, the best controllers, how staff were um, trained and how they behaved and what they could do. They spent a good deal of money and a good deal of time and energy, and they reduced the average handling time of bags from plane to carousel from about 15 minutes down below 10. It's pretty good. Cost them a fair amount of money, but it put them on a benchmark that was right up there in the world. You, you would be hard pressed to find an airline and an air port that was handling luggage better than these guys were when they did it. So with a degree of self-satisfied pride, and anticipation, the annual customer survey came back at the end of the year 
and the number one source of complaints from customers was now how long they had to wait for their baggage at the baggage carousel. What's going on? Why? We've spent all this money, we've shortened the time, it's now well down on what it used to be, it's down around eight minutes. Why are they still complaining? Someone understood that they must have missed something. So instead of going and simply trying to reduce that number further, they went and did some research and they watched customers. And they followed them from the plane all the way out to the baggage carousel and looked at what they were doing while they waited. And what they found was that so the bag took eight minutes to get from the plane to the carousel. It only took the passenger one. So the passengers got off the plane because they were putting the plane as near the exit as they could. Passengers got off the plane. They walk one minute to the baggage carousel and they wait here for seven minutes. Hmm. Again, somebody had the bright idea. What if we moved the plane? So they did. They moved the plane so that the plane was as far away from the baggage carousel as they could make it. And now it took eight or nine minutes to walk from the plane to the carousel. By which stage, like magic, the bags were there. <laughs> this is fantastic. This is the best airport in the world. People didn't mind walking further. If you've been on a plane for a long time, you don't care. You get to stretch your legs. You know, you get to look around. You can go to a shop, go to the toilet. You know, like it's, it's kind of pleasant to get off a plane and go for a bit of a walk. And then, just like magic, you arrive at the baggage carousel and you can just pick up your bag and keep going. That was wonderful. That year the survey came out and there were almost no complaints about waiting time for bags. There were complaints about baggage handling, sure, some things got lost, some things got broken, but no one was complaining now about how long they had to wait, because they didn't. Nor did they complain about how long they had to walk. So they didn't change one problem for another complaint, they actually gave people something to do that they were happy with. And the thing that came from it was they looked at it from the perspective of the person. How are they feeling? And how are they thinking? And what might we do to change that? And they basically shifted them from a passive waiting state to effectively an active waiting state. And we think of those two things completely differently. Could have saved themselves millions by doing that right up front. Oh, we just... It was good for them anyway, because they, you know, it meant less baggage handlers and they saved money and, you know, less complaints all around. But this is the type of thing where if we focus on functionality, if we focus on technology and not think about people, even in these kind of physical environments, we can absolutely lose opportunities to make a difference to people. And with that, I'll leave you alone. Thank you. Parabéns. Obrigado por compartilhar com a gente essa experiência. E está muito alinhado com o meu próximo projeto, que também envolve arquitetura, acessibilidade e tal. Ontem eu apresentei um paper sobre experiência audiovisual para cegos e tudo mais. E quando eu vi ali um monte de dados que você coletou, como você é, compilou e fez, foi no lugar e fez os vídeos e fotos e tal, foi muito parecido com o meu processo. Eu queria entender só um pouquinho do teu processo, o depois, porque para mim foi muito penoso pegar aquilo tudo, é, transformar em dados reais e como eu podia melhorar a experiência daquelas pessoas, entendeu? E se você tem alguma maneira mais fácil ou se pode me contribuir com alguma forma de como fazer, como melhorar. There's, there's really no magic to that part of it, I'm sorry. Um, it really can take a long time. Um, that kind of... Um, analysis with so many data points, you know, if you spend a week doing uh, research, then you should probably spend a week doing analysis. If you spent three weeks, then spend three weeks doing analysis. There aren't any shortcuts and you probably don't want there to be. Um, 
that's probably one of the most disheartening answers you might get to a question like that, and I'm sorry, but I'm really glad you're doing the type of work that you just described. I think that's fantastic. And yeah, sorry, no shortcuts. É, depois que eu me especializei em design de interação, coincidentemente eu fiz arquitetura sustentável. E enquanto eu estudei um ano e meio é, arquitetura para poder entender como é que arquitetos trabalham, é, porque eu queria fazer o um mestrado, é, tinha coisas do nosso mundo de design que a gente sempre compartilhou, mas quando chegava nessa parte de design think é, cocriação, colaboração, empatia, isso não existia. É, também não. coisas que a gente lidar com todos os dias, como gamificação, eram coisas de outro mundo para os arquitetos e professores que estavam lá ensinando a gente. E a gente lida com o mesmo material, assim, um capital humano, porque a gente está projetando para pessoas. Por que é que a chave desses profissionais é, não virou? ainda, né? E como é que a gente faz para poder fazer com isso que aconteça? Porque é, eu conheço poucos projetos que é, as empresas que foram contratadas pediram para que aquele projeto arquitetônico fosse feito de modo colaborativo, por exemplo. É igual a sede da CIT em Campinas, foi feita a partir do que os, os próprios funcionários queriam. Então, a minha pergunta basicamente nesse sentido como é que faz para virar a chave desses profissionais que entende o usuário no manual de um lado BNT da vida? Ok. Sorry, I need to remove these headphones because they start speaking Portuguese in my ear when I start talking. So, um, in many cases, we cannot. So, to your point about how do we change their minds, for a lot of these, uh, for a lot of these practitioners, they've been at it for too long for us to change their mind. We can wait for them to retire and hope the younger ones coming through have a much better attitude. That's number one. The second one, though, is that we need to be in a position to demonstrate that we've got value to offer. So we need to be going to them with proof points about what we've learned and how it can help them. And if we're not, why the hell should they believe us? And why should they change? We need, we need to be the ones pushing. And we need to make sure that bit by bit, we are helping to demonstrate that there's value in shifting. In my home state of New South Wales, the uh, New South Wales Transport um, department. It's called Transport for New South Wales, but it's the government department who commissions transport projects in, in our state. They're spending uh, probably 40 odd billion dollars Australian this year on infrastructure projects in our home state. And they have dictated to the architects and the engineers who want to build these things that they must adopt a customer centered design process. It must have direct input from customers who are the kind of diverse groups that I've been talking about. It must go through iterations. It must be tested in a variety of different ways. They've been very, very explicit about it. And that is driving a change in the behavior. So those projects are some of the ones where a construction company who's made billions out of just digging tunnels through rock and putting, like laying track down and never talking to a customer, they're coming to a company like ours um, and, and approaching people like us and saying, we need your help. We don't work like this. We don't understand. We're not sure how to engage or what to do with the information that we've gathered. Help us. And that's having a huge impact. So it's, it's positive, and certainly the, the amount of work that we've been doing this year in this space has been really encouraging, and encouraging that for at least some groups, and it will spread, that at least some groups it's becoming a real point of, uh, of importance and will make a huge difference. I hope that answered the question. Thank you, Steve. Thank you.